And so we are up to lecture six in Rudolf Steiner's uh, commentary to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and in this chapter, uh, Steiner says, starts, he starts off by saying that uh, before the Buddha had, had incarnated as the Buddha, he had been this bodhisattva being who had gone through a whole bunch of incarnations. And during these incarnations, he had never been fully physically incarnate in a physical body. Uh, there was always a part of him that remained behind in the spiritual world and these individualities correspondingly had great sort of external auras of their etheric bodies surrounding them, which weren't fully contracted and in the physical body, uh, which enables clairvoyant abilities, um, but not uh, a full engagement with the physical earthly plane. Uh, so it wasn't until the Buddha uh, came along, until a body uh, was prepared perfectly for this bodhisattva, that he was able to fully incarnate into that body and therefore teach uh, human beings a, a moral tenor of an inward philosophy about how to find the law of Dharma within themselves through practicing the Eightfold Path. Um, and then so he says um, that Buddhism then was entirely inward and it taught men to turn inward and in a very spiritually mature way find uh, the law of Dharma within themselves, whereas um, the traditions of the Hebrews are entirely outer based and especially also with uh, Zarathustra and Zoroastrianism, it's also outer-based. With Zoroaster, we have this vision that is cosmological, whereas in early Hinayana Buddhism, Hinayana Buddhism, there is no cosmology, there is no soul. It's nihilistic in that sense. But it is inward. I agree with Steiner that it is an inward teaching of self-salvation uh, that does not require uh, help from anyone else. It's the difference between what in Japan or, or what in India, it's India actually, that is known as the way of the kitten versus the way of the monkey. Uh, the kitten meows and expects its mother to come pick it up by the scruff of the neck and save it. Um, so that's kind of the religious traditions that we've inherited in the West, uh, as opposed to the East, where the traditions are of self-salvation, the monkey way. Uh, when the mother skedaddles, uh, the monkeys grab onto her and hang on. Uh, they save themselves in that sense. So, uh, so that's sort of the difference and it might be worth uh, reminding ourselves of just what Zarathustra's vision actually was. Um, it's purely cosmological and it is very outer directed. Um, the idea is that there is a 12,000 year arc of history that is broken into four distinct stages of 3,000 years each. And in the beginning, Ahura Mazda, you know, whom Steiner says is the Zoroastrian version of the Christ being, the sun god, uh, is the lord of a kingdom of light total light, and then Angra Mainyu, who is also Araman, whom Steiner imports into his ideas uh, as a principle of materialistic evil. But here we'll call him Angra Mainyu. Uh, Angra Mainyu is lord over a world of darkness, and Ahura Mazda uh, asks, himself, asks him, proposes peace. Let's have peace, uh, and Angra Mainyu rejects it. So then Ahura Mazda goes ahead and creates the world, uh, the sun, the stars, the constellations, the earth, um, then Angra Mainyu goes through his creation, poisoning it. He poisons the earth with hurricanes, floods, uh, scorpions, snakes, uh, instead of flat plains, mountainous, mountain, mountainous terrain that is difficult to pass over. Um, so he injects the principle of negativity all through Ahura Mazda's creation. And this first period ends with the slaying of the cosmic ox and the cosmic man. When Angra Mainyu slays the cosmic ox uh, from its semen, uh, onto the ground spring up all the animals and from its spinal marrow spring up all the food plants uh, whereas when he kills Gaiomart the primordial man uh, his body falls into the earth and decays and the metals in the earth come from his body all the rare and precious metals and from out of one of them namely gold springs up a flower on which the Adam and Eve of this tradition uh, are found when it opens up there is Masha and Mashoi who are the Adam and Eve of this tradition um, and then Angra Mainyu, as Araman, uh, tempts them into having sexual intercourse, which they do, and they produce offspring that they love so much that they eat them. And so Ahura Mazda has to turn tone down parental love by about 90% so that parents don't just eat their children, <laughs> like hamsters do. If you touch their offspring, they'll eat them. Um, so, so that's the first sort of epoch, and then we get to the middle of this epoch. Uh, which note is about 6000 BC, so that the Zoroastrian idea of when Zarathustra lived agrees with the Greek idea of about 6000 BC, not that there's anything to it. 
It's just interesting to note the correspondence. Halfway through world history, Zarathustra then appears as the prophet of this whole new religion that is based on a total rejection of any Indian ideas of perfecting yourself by leaving the world and uh, performing a religion of self-salvation, as in Buddhism or in any of the yogic traditions of India, but instead doing your duty to society, uh, working with the Amisha Spentas, which are the prototypes of the angels uh, in the Zoroastrian tradition, and they all personify different virtues, right conduct, right doing, right this, right that. It's a little like the Buddha's uh, Eightfold Path. Working as a society towards a restoration. We're trying to get back to a restoration of the way things were in the kingdom of light before the fall. And then there is, of course, at the end of world history, uh, which also has its own apocalypse, there will come another great figure, Sao Shant. We've had three great figures then, Gaiomart at the beginning, Zarathustra right in the middle, and at the end, the Sao Shant will come. And he will separate the damned from the blessed. Uh, a comet will crash into the earth and melt all the metals and shove the mountains down into a flat white plain of molten uh, lava, let's say, that um, the damned go through and they're tormented, but when the blessed go through it, they experience it as just like warm milk. And so the kingdom of light will be restored and the blessed will live forever uh, in this, what sounds pretty boring to me, <laughs> a boring world of light, but it's a cosmological teaching and it's entirely outer directed. And so is the uh, idea of the Hebrews uh, with Moses, who inherits the etheric body of Zarathustra then. So there's a stream then, as far as Steiner is concerned, from Zoroastrianism, and, and there is actually, into Judaism, through the Babylonian captivity, uh, where the Jews picked up lots of uh, Zoroastrian ideas, such as Satan, uh, and Satan becomes their theft of Angra Mainyu, uh, which was brought back by Ezra when they go back to rebuild the temple when they're restored by the Persians to their homeland. Um, Satan uh, is another term that um, Steiner picks up as his, he has two adversaries, everything for Steiner is polytheistic. Um, Ar Armon on the one hand, which was Angra Mainyu, uh, but also Lucifer, who is his transformation of the biblical Satan. Uh, Lucifer is the being who tempts man toward spiritual pride, uh, toward rebellion. Uh, he confers on man free will. Uh, that's the positive aspect of it, but that free will can lead to pride, arrogance, uh, inflation, spiritual inflation, and so forth. So these are the two negative principles in Steiner's cosmology. Uh, and so this is the, <clears throat> the outer directed world of Zoroastrianism that is then inherited by the Jews. And with Moses then we have the creation of the Decalogue, which Steiner says is homologous. It's equivalent to the Buddhist law of Dharma uh, and the Eightfold Path, but that's found within in a society that is spiritually far more advanced at this point than the Hebrews are. The Hebrews are a bit behind. They're a bit, uh, they're spiritual laggards in this sense. Um, in the sense, he says that, uh, like an ind you could compare two individuals, one who develops lots of faculties early in his life, let's say by the age of 20, uh, but then by the age of 30, he can't really, there's nothing really else more for him to develop. And it's very difficult for him to change. Um, whereas another individual, uh, like the Nathan Jesus, who does not acquire so many faculties and is relatively backward for a long time, by the age of 30, then uh, might achieve a spiritual flowering, um, as was the case in India. So we have these two streams uh, going sort of side by side, but the Indian stream is much more advanced. It's, of course, way older. Steiner doesn't say this, but I mean, it's way older than the Hebrew stream. So we have the Decalogue, and Moses brings it uh, down from the mountain. And the Decalogue, uh, as Jonathan Kirsch in his biography of Moses remarks, may be the only document ever actually written by Moses and preserved uh, because all the other stuff that goes on, the taxes and the tithes that go on with the people in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are all farmers. Uh, whereas we know the Hebrews were nomads. Uh, but if uh, Kirsch says, if we look at some of these laws <clears throat> in the light of a nomadic society, uh, they, they take on a different ring. For instance, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Actually, it might mean as a wandering nomadic tribe, don't covet life in the cities. We don't want anything to do with the cities. Uh, thou shalt not uh, steal, uh, may actually mean not stealing, not theft in general, but specifically don't, don't steal each other's slaves. Um, these nomads apparently had slaves. Thou shalt not kill, there again does not mean killing in general, it means eschew the blood vendetta, the tribal blood vendetta, and let that go. Um, or thou shalt not take the Lord, 
God's name in vain may actually means uh, don't use the name of God in magical spells against your enemies. So this all does seem to fit. The Decalogue does seem to come out of a tribal consciousness, uh, which is spiritually immature. These, these nomads that are wandering, it is a very spiritually uh, childlike young culture that is coming along here where the Decalogue has to be opposed upon them as commandments from without. Um, so they're lagging behind in a certain sense by comparison with India, but that will change, of course, with the Christ child, uh, where there will be a massive flowering. Um, this is a little bit like Goethe, I remember in his somewhere in his metamorphosis of plants, comparing two different plants, one that uh, is in poor soil and flowers early on and quickly, um, and then, but then dies early. There's a kind of law of the anticipation of its life cycle. It flowers early. Um, whereas one who matures much more slowly, as Goethe says, everything truly great matures slowly um, and, and then has great fruits later on. Uh, and I've noticed this too in the comparison of a lot of the lives of great individuals, some of whom die young, uh, like say Keats or uh, Kleist, who shot himself and his lover uh, in, a, in a pact, in a mutual suicide, homicide pact. Uh, terrible fate. He was very young when he did this. But we already have all these great stories in place from Kleist. It's, it is as if there is a, Raphael is another example, as if there is an anticipation of an early death. Let's get this stuff done now uh, before I leave the stage, where somebody like Goethe has spent his whole life living up into his 80s, uh, had a very slow development, as did Shakespeare as well. When you compare the plays of Shakespeare to those of Marlowe, for instance, um, at about the same time, uh, Shakespeare still has a long ways to go as he's working through his history plays. It takes him a while to find his game, uh, whereas Marlowe Marlo finds it very quickly, puts out five or six plays, and then is stabbed through the eye in a bar fight. Um, so it's interesting about this law of anticipation uh, that Goethe talks about with respect to plants, and he means it as analogous to spiritual maturity uh, in the culture that individuals bring. Uh, and so this is the situation with the Decalogue and um, the Zoroastrian stream going through the Hebrews and preparing them. And then he says, especially with respect to John the Baptist now, we also have to look at the fact that he was Elijah in an earlier incarnation. And Elijah too had this problem whereby um, his ego was not fully incarnate in a physical body. It was still partially in the spiritual world, which enabled him to perform great spiritual feats and to go into ecstatic prophetic trance states. Uh, but with John now, uh, in the womb of Elizabeth, something different happens. Uh, when Mary goes to visit her, and Elizabeth is six months along here in the beginning of the Luke Gospel, uh, Elizabeth is six months along, uh, Mary is already pregnant, and goes to visit her. The Nirmanakaya of the Buddha has already attached itself to the Nathan child, and goes along with her. And in a mysterious way, the contact between the two women has the effect of the Buddha reawakening the ego within the womb of Elizabeth, uh, of John, of firmly binding it to the embryo so that it isn't like how it was before with Elijah, where the ego was still partially half in the astral plane and half in the physical plane. John will be firmly rooted in the ground. He will be fully much closer to the earthly world than to the spiritual world because of the Buddha's interaction with him via Mary's visit to Elizabeth, which quickens within her womb and awakens the ego of John uh, as, he's about, as she's about six months along. So that when John begins to perform his preaching now, uh, his preaching, certain aspects of it sound like the Buddhas, insofar as the Buddha, uh, these two, as I've said before, Buddhism and Christianity are religions of credo, and they both differ for them from the matrices, the mother wombs that they both came out of. Uh, and here Steiner is speaking about Christianity coming out of a, of a mother womb, namely the Hebraic uh, religion, which is purely one based on ethnicity. Uh, it matters who your parents are amongst the Hebrews. In India, it matters who your parents are because whoever your parents are, the caste that they were in is the caste that you are stuck with. Um, there's, you don't, there's no ideas of social mobility as there is in the West. You're stuck with your caste. I'm sure there are plenty of exceptions to this rule as there always are, but the rule is that the caste you're born into is the caste you remain. But the Buddha's not saying that. The Buddha comes along, Steiner says, and, and says, Forget about what the Brahmins say about who you're descended from. None of that matters. This is a religion for individuals in whom within everyone who can find the law of the Dharma and perform the right actions, right duties, right thinking, right endeavor, and so forth through the Eightfold Path 
Anyone can do this. You don't have to be from any particular caste whatsoever. And so Buddhism had a great success in India, uh, but then was exterminated uh, for a long, long time. And it's only just nowadays I hear beginning to make a comeback there. Um, and John, uh, when he gives the, uh, when Luke recounts the preaching that he gives here, says something similar, almost as though he's anticipating Christ's message when he, when he says here, um, he says, uh, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children to Abraham. From, from these stones, not from previous biological living descendants with warm blood in them, but from these stones. So it almost sounds like Steiner says that this is the Buddha's message, again, on a higher turn of the spiral being spoken now by John, since the Buddha has visited him in the womb of Elizabeth and quickened his ego there. Uh, to sort of reactivate Buddhism, but in a new context now, uh, which, which will happen to a spiritually immature people that will quicken and transform them with the Christ event into a, a people that is even more spiritually mature than Buddhism. Um, so, because the message is a, a cutting of the ties to all blood kinship, none of that matters. Uh, and Sanchez says, so look at the Zarathustra individuality that lived in the Solomon Jesus boy, the Solomon Jesus boy has these brothers and sisters, uh, but the father dies, uh, the, the Joseph there dies, uh, and his ego leaves that family, so he leaves behind, uh, just as the Buddha also, as a lonely individual, leaves the palace behind to wander off all by himself. So too here, uh, the Zarathustra ego lives for 12 years in the Solomon, Solomon boy and then transmigrates into the Nathan Jesus, um, whose mother has, uh, who died, his mother dies then, uh, the Mary to whom the Annunciation is given then dies. Then shortly thereafter, his father Joseph also dies. And this is interesting. This must have been well known as a tradition that these parent that uh, these parents died. That the Mary comes over from the Solomon boy to unite with the Joseph, uh, because in much there, I was researching some Monarchian texts yesterday, and one of them is called the Widow, uh, and it refers specifically to Mary, uh, which tradition recognizes as a widow. So Steiner must be onto something here about the deaths of these parents. But in any case, the idea is that Zarathustra, living within the uh, body of the Nathan Jesus from the age of 12 to 30, has now cut all ties. All blood ties have been cut, in, in essence, with the loss of the parents and his transmigrating from one family to another. The emphasis is definitely not on descent from the blood. And Steiner wants to highlight this fact that Zarathustra as he reincarnates in the Solomon, Solomon boy, transmigrates to the Nathan boy, is cutting all blood kinship ties, as this will not be a religion based on uh, your descent. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It's a religion of credo that welcomes all comers. All you have to do is say, I believe in the Christ event. Uh, and there you are. You're a Christian. And so that's it for this lecture, lecture number six. Uh, and we'll move right along to lecture number seven here.